All right, guys, you ready? Okay, so am I. Some more report on South Darren. Uh, hi, folks, my name is Bob Mata, and I am the host of Defense Diaries, which is a podcast. Um, what I'm going to be going through today is kind of the story of how I came to be doing a podcast about John Wayne Gacy. And has anybody heard my show out there? Our show? Okay. A few of you, a few of you, good. Hopefully when you leave this seminar or this, this uh, presentation, you'll all want to listen to it. It's pretty good. Um, we're going to play the very beginning of, of the presentation. We're going to play you some audio. Okay? And it's going to last for about four minutes long. And what you'll be hearing is John Wayne Gacy talking with my father, who was his defense attorney back in 1978. Now these tapes are one of a kind, no one else on the planet has them, Joe Berlinger doesn't have them, Joe Berlinger didn't use them, and it's a Netflix thing, which was my pitch back in 2019. So what you're going to be hearing is we're the only ones on the planet who has this sound. And it's different because what you're listening to is a defense attorney trying to prepare his client and himself to go forward with an insanity defense at trial. And we'll get into that a little bit in terms of why they went with the insanity defense with Gacy. But, um, so when you're listening to this, think of it in terms of, it, it's, it's different. If you've seen the, the Gacy video from 94 when he's on death row a year away from, like months before he's gonna die, that's, it's different. This is uh, audio where you're hearing a serial killer, one of the most infamous in our country's history, really trying to pull the wool over my father's eyes over a series of months. Um, but without further ado, we're going to play the first clip, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. He had left that they got enough of the dead and dead in the apartment away from him. With dead things in the apartment away from him, that's why he wasn't going home. His dad had kicked him out of the house, his dad had kicked him out of the apartment, told him that he was going through his own and wanted to get rid of him. Get out. That's what some of the time he charged the car. He charged the car through the meeting, you know, and uh, then his father took the apartment back from him, ran it out, and then he was going to not pay for the car. Back. That's Which good. Not my dad. He had a check coming about, I believe, about 125 to 150 uh, somewhere in there. He wanted his check. He said, I can get the car from you back to the dad. It's like hell. And I'm going to go argue with your dad. So then he got into an argument. That was the argument. We were fucking around, arguing back and forth. And. Uh, I talked to him and put the handcuffs on. Once he got the handcuffs on, I pinned it down and I told him, I said, you might as well settle down and get it straight for one and for all. I am not going to get into the deck. I thought I'm going to shoot. What the hell did you do? Mm -hmm. uh, and then he said, let me have my sign, let me have to go to the I said, you know, guys, I don't want to go for the car. Mm -hmm. You're not giving me your money until I get mine. And then he told me, that if I didn't let him up, or why, if I would let him up, go. Fred, go. You know what I mean? I'll do. He said, could he have enough to lose? I said, well, if that's it, that's it. So we can think that. Then I said, do you or me? I am assuming from that point forward, I don't remember. If I kill them or I just left them on the floor. I do know that he's dead. One day we remember his name is dead. About 6 30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, he was still laying on the living room floor. Did he have his clothes on? Yep. Was he his skull hands on? Yep. Went back home or probably. And back when he was dressed. Yeah. How was he killed? How was he killed? So, what you just heard there Mary, Scott, is, is we're a little clunky, but we'll get through it. Um, 
So what you just heard there uh, is referring to what is believed to have been John Gacy's third victim, um, a young kid named John Bukovich. And John Bukovich was, and there's a, a bit of a misnomer that, that Gacy kind of preyed upon, uh, strictly like wayward souls, kids that had gone out to the streets, kids that were selling themselves uh, in order to kind of survive out on the streets, and that's simply not the case. Gacy had two MOs. Um, he would prey upon the kids that he hired to work for his contracting company, um, and John Bukovich was one of those kids. So that discussion that they were having, my father had asked him uh, about the situation of how he came to kill John Bukovich. And to preface what these tapes really became about, if you're not aware, how, how many of you guys are aware of the Gacy story generally? Pretty much everybody? Okay. And so am I. So when I was 10 years old, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. My parents were divorced. I had flown back in from, from Colorado. My father was living in Chicago. And on December 21st, it was Christmas break, the Gacy case broke. So it's about 10 o'clock at night. I'm sitting on the couch with my father. We're watching the news. And there's this news flash that comes on. And it's back in 1978. So it's old school. So it's my father, uh, my uncle, and I all sitting in the room, and they start talking about this house in Norwood Park, unincorporated Norwood Park, that they're pulling bodies out of. Okay, and at that point, I think they had pulled two bodies out the first night that Gacy was arrested. So as the news progresses, about 20 minutes in, this little short guy comes on, and he uh, he's introduced as being John Wayne Gacy's attorney. My dad says, "Holy shit, I know him." That guy was Sam Amaranti. So this is obviously pre-email, pre-texting. My dad says, you know, should I reach out to him and see if he needs help on the case? Because my, my father had just left the public defender's office at that point, um, and he was handling the worst of the worst over at 26 in Cal. So me being nine years old, not really having any idea what I was watching on TV, I thought it would be cool if my dad was on TV like the other lawyer. So I said, yeah, you should definitely <laughs> Now, to this day, my father still blames me for him getting involved with the case, um, you know, because he said it was, it was one of the tougher experiences of his life. Needless to say, the next day, he goes out to Western Union, sends an old school telegram asking Amaranti if he needs help on the case. Amaranti says, fuck yes. <laughs> Weren't many cases like that. It, it was like a case of that magnitude, which became clear in very short order that it was going to be a nationally televised and nationally watched and followed case because years earlier you had Dean Coral who would murder 27 down in, in Texas and I, you didn't really hear about him. You know, Gacy was kind of a different beast. And so my father gets involved with the case. Um, he becomes one of the trial attorneys. They go through the trial. Years pass. I'm. 21 years old on my 21st birthday, he threw a party for me. We were at a Mexican restaurant in this town I grew up called Oak Park, and he hands me a box as my gift. And I, I'm like honestly hoping for, I was driving around a beater. I had like a, I think it was like a 78 AMC Matador. This thing was like a giant piece of shit. So, and I'm 21, so I, I honestly, I was hoping that he got me a car. So, you know, everyone's standing around. You know, I open the gift and it's an old shoe box. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's trying to fool me. So I open it and there's cassette tapes in there. And I'm like, I wonder, I, I have no idea what they are. I put the lid back on and I see that I'm, and you scroll down there two words and it's like Gacy tapes. So he pulls me aside and he says, you know, look, and I, I didn't realize he had them. These weren't like some, some item that he talked about all the time. He had kind of kept it to himself that he had these things. And he, he took me to the side and said, look, you know, these are unique. They're historic. There's nothing like them. Um, they're my interviews with Gacy from when we were preparing for trial. And I'm giving them to you because someday maybe we we'll be able to find a way to use them. And so fast forward 30 years. I sat in my closet for 30 years. And I hadn't even listened to him until I decided to do the podcast. So what I want to do now, now when I got the tapes, and, and by the way, this is my friend and my executive producer, Darren Wood. 
He handles all the magic on the back end, so hopefully when you do listen to our pod and you realize how well produced it is, he's the guy who does that. Um, but what the real magic was is when we first started producing the podcast, we realized the tapes sounded like shit. They were recorded on, depending on your age, you know, it was one of the old rectangular push-button tape recorders that you stuck a cassette in that had one microphone. And my father, in his infinite wisdom, had put the microphone facing him instead of towards Gacy for all of the tapes. And on top of that, we're talking about 40-year-old tapes, so by the time we digitized them, they were rough. And so when we released the first four episodes of Defense Diaries, I was warning people on the podcast, I said, look, these tapes are tough to hear. You're going to have to lean in sometimes if you're listening in your car. You know, you're going to have to do a little work to hear them clearly. We were posting what you guys saw on, uh, with the transcripts of all the tapes on our website because we wanted people to understand what he was saying because it's fascinating. A lot of it is, is unbelievable. So we upgraded our equipment over time and, and Darren went to work on upgrading the tapes or, and upgrading the sound. So. What we'd like to do is just play you a small sample of what the sound like. So try to remember what you just heard with the tapes, and then are you ready? Are you sure. queued up for that? Yeah. Okay, and then we're gonna show you what they sounded like initially when we first released the podcast. Go. It's brutal. It's brutal. So, how did you get it done? Studio magic. <laughs> oh boy, with those details, it's just it's one knob. Studio magic. Yeah, it's. I mean, and that's what it was. Like, so when when he got the sound fixed and he sent it to me, I was walking my dog, and he's like, "You should take a listen to this." And I was blown away. It's it, you know, it's like trying to go back in a time machine to fix something that you think is irreparable, you can't fix it because it's, it's already been recorded. But So he did amazing work there um, and for the rest of the series, which in our podcast we probably featured about 12 hours of tape, and it's not just us playing the tape. What, what we decided to do, there's been a lot done in Gacy, you guys have probably seen all the docs that have been done, maybe read some of the books, and I have too. Like Gacy has been a weird part of my life since I was 10 years old, that's just a fact. It's, it's always been part of my life, not necessarily in my face all the time, but it's always been present. So when we, when we decided to do the pod, I called Darren. It was during the beginning of the pandemic. I am a criminal defense attorney by trade, um, and I decided I was going to do this pod because I really did pitch Joe Berlinger back in 2019. I said, look, I've got the sound, because he had just dropped his Bundy tape, uh, Confessions of a Killer. That night, I, I emailed him and said, hey, look, man, I have some tapes you might want to use the sound on. I was thinking you might get back to me at some point. He got back to me in five minutes. I negotiated for nine months. I couldn't get a deal one time. And you know, thankfully for me and for Darren, we wouldn't be doing the show if I had licensed the tapes. So going into it, we didn't know how we were going to format the show. I knew that I wanted to do a narrative, but I knew that I didn't want to focus on Casey because we all heard the same shit about that guy for the last 40 years. It's always Waterloo, and he, you know, he, get, he gets arrested in Waterloo, and he gets a 10-year bid, but he only does a year and a half, and he moves to Chicago, and he buys a house, and he's married to Carol Hoff, you know, and it, same thing, over and over and over, the same interviews with the same cops, you know, everything is the same. I've never heard anything new. So we said, you know what, and the one thing that you never hear about with Gacy are the victims, ever. There's 33 of them. At least. At least. And we decided, you know what, we're going to focus on the victims way more than anybody else has. Because, you know what, anything that you want to know about Gacy, about Gacy, is already out there. You can, you can consume everything else that talks about the same thing that they talk about with respect to him on every single thing that's ever been done on him. So we, we decided we were going to focus on the victims. We are going to focus on the police investigation. Because I wanted to know why in six years Chicago police couldn't get a damn thing done and Des Plaines Police Department got him under arrest in 10 days. It's amazing. Six years, nothing, 33 kids killed, one kid goes missing in Des Plaines, Rob Peace, the last victim, 
and they, they get it done in 10 days. So for us, that was pretty interesting. I wanted to know how they did it. So we start diving in. So we've got, we've got two sources of material. We have the tapes, and then I went and got my hands on uh, the initial and original investigation reports of the Displains Police, all, every report that was ever written by anyone. And I started digging in. I was gonna, my, my father asked me, he's like, why are you retrying the case, Bob? I said, I'm not, Dad. I said, I'm just digging in. So we decide that we're gonna start interviewing all the old cops. And I wanted to see if I could get them to tell me something different. I was gonna try to take a different angle. You know, we're, we're doing the investigation, the arrest, the trial, and the victims. That's what our podcast is gonna be about. So we're about five episodes in, and we're playing the tapes a lot. I'm kind of talking about, I tell that story about how I came to be in possession of the tapes. And the first guy, the first cop that we're able to interview is a cop named Mike Albrecht, and he worked for Display. And so he was kind enough to come out to where we had our studio set up. And I started interviewing Mike. He goes through, and I, and I had heard all his interviews on all the documentaries he's ever done. He always says that they all always say the same stories. They all have the same stories over and over. So that's when I finally say, hey, you know, is there anything else that, that you have that you can tell me that you've never told anybody? And at that point, are you ready to play it? I think so. You think, you think so, you think so? so this, this is what he tells us. And then I'll explain the significance of it. Well, I don't know if it's, uh, it was never brought up that way. Um, so I, I don't know if that's something that someone was, well, um, they, he had, uh, Rob Peace Jack was recovered in uh, the second search warrant, I believe. And um, when Rob Peace went out to talk to AC, uh, Kim Myers was working at the front of the counter, the cashier, which was right by the front door. And, you know, it was December, it was cold. So um, they, uh, uh, she had, for some reason, she put Rob's jacket on. And she uh, asked Rob for, so he obviously gave it to her. And she processed the photo uh, processing. I mean, she brought some film that we developed, and she had to, and got there her receipt. And apparently, she put that receipt in her pocket. And um, then, when um, well, uh, that was something that you know. And when I mentioned it to you, it was the first time. I think I said that it was the first time that I ever talked about it. And uh, um, so, who are we to argue with? You know. State's attorneys and all that stuff, so um, and it was never brought up. I feel kind of bad about that, I know, but I mean, yeah, that's uh, I know it wasn't that, it was a couple of days after that because that's why it didn't make much sense. I mean, I'm not saying where they found it because there's a gap and you're leaving that gap open, that gap open, uh, who knows what's going to happen, how it's going to come out, so but um. So do you guys know what he's talking about? Are you that familiar with the Gacy case to know what he's talking about? Anybody? Yeah, the receipt from the photo would pin him or link him to Rob Peace. To Correct. His house, and they found it in his garden. Correct. So that has been the story for 43 years. So for, and for you youngsters out there who have never used an actual camera, that has actual film. Back in the old days, we used to have to go, we'd take our film roll, we'd go to a place that would process our film and make pictures for us. So we'd take our film roll, we'd drop it in an envelope, they'd seal it, and they'd give us a receipt. And they'd say, come back in 10 days and pick up your pictures. So what that, that film receipt that you're talking about is they're saying that Kim Byers who was a girl that worked with the last victim, Rob Peace, at Nissan Pharmacy, had developed film. And that she was wearing, and this has been the story on how they got Gacy for 43 years. Like that, this is how they got him. So after she puts Rob's jacket on, because as Mike said, she was standing near the front of the door. It was a brutal winter in Chicago that year. Like it was under 10 the entire winter, just freezing. So, as, as, as legend has it, she's wearing the jacket. She then allegedly develops the film, gets the photo receipt, and unwittingly puts it in Rob's jacket just because she's wearing it. And then Rob, at some point, 
overhears a conversation between a contractor who was in who was going to be doing a remodel because Gacy was a contractor and he kind of focused on pharmacy remodels. So he's talking to the owner of the pharmacy. He sees Rob Peace because that's the kind of predator he was. And Gacy didn't do anything by mishap. Everything was planned out. So he's talking to, to Larry Torf, the owner of the pharmacy, and he's speaking loudly. He's like, oh, you know what? I'm hiring. I'm hiring for the summer. And he always hired young guys, 16 to 20. That's, that was because that's what he liked. And I'm paying five to seven bucks an hour. Now, in the meantime, Rob is turning 16. He's 15 going on 16. He's saving for a car. And he's making 235 an hour at the pharmacy. It happens to be Rob Peace Muller's birthday. So the first conversation with Gacy takes place. Uh, Gacy leaves. Now Gacy gets back home, Full Torf calls him and says, Hey John, you left your Bible, which was his appointment book. Now that again was not done by accident. Gacy left that there. He planted the seed where he had the conversation around Rob Peace so that he knew that he would hear it. He left his book, he waited, in Torf, the owner of the pharmacy, waited, you know, maybe 15 minutes because he knew that's how far Gacy lived. He called him immediately. Gacy, in return, then waits until 8.50 to drive back because the pharmacy closes at 9. He goes back, goes in, picks up his appointment book, and Rob Peace's mother, like two ships passing in the night, walks into the pharmacy. She had come to pick Rob up to bring him home to celebrate her birthday. And at that point, Gacy grabs his, his Bible, and again, that's just his appointment book, but that's what he referred to, goes out the door. Rob Peace grabs his jacket, his mother has walked in, he says, hold on, Mom, I gotta go talk to this guy about a job in the summer. That's the last time Rob Peace has ever seen. So, from that, the story is born that Rob Peace jacket, he's obviously taken by Gacy, he's obviously brought to Gacy's home, he's obviously murdered by Gacy, and he's dumped in the Splains River. So Mrs. Peace was the fiercest of mama bears. So when her son, when the, 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 this was not a runaway. She was, she went to the Des Police Department and said, I want my fucking son found. We all know what happened to him, we know that it was that contractor guy. Within the next, by the next day, they had John Wayne Gacy's name because they simply had to call Phil Torf and say, who was the contractor? Like the kid said he was going to talk to that guy. He was the only contractor that was in the, in the building. We know it was him. Like we want to go talk to him. So within a day, Desplaines has Gacy's name. That same day, Lieutenant Kozenzak, who was the Desplaines cop who was handling the investigation, drove over to Gacy's house to talk to him. Say, hey, you know, did you did you talk to Rob Peace? And if you did, where did he say he was going when you left your house? Because we haven't seen him since. So when when Kozenzak gets over on the first day, and so we're on December 11th, now we're on December 12th. Okay, this is this is when Kozenzak goes over there. Gacy blows him off when he gets to the door. He said, I'm busy. My uncle's in the hospital. I don't I don't have time to talk to you. I'll I'll try to make it to the station later on that night. That I, I can't, like, you gotta listen to the podcast because it'll take up the entire hour. So, so the bottom line is they end up getting a first search warrant on December 13th. So it only takes them two days. There's no, and does anybody know what you need for a search warrant in order for the police to get a search warrant to enter your home? You know what the term is? Thank you. Probable cause is exactly what it is. They can't just go into your house. They have to go in front of the judge and they have to get probable cause to enter your home. And that stands for all of us. Cops have to have a probable cause to get in the house. Initially, they thought that it was enough that Rob Peace had last been seen in the pharmacy, had said that he was going to call, uh, going to go meet with the contractor, and then disappeared off the face of the earth. The judge felt that that was enough to get into the house. December 13th, they go and do the first search of John Wayne Gacy's house. Okay, and it is about eight officers from the Displains Police Department and one officer who was what they call an evidence tech from the Cook County Sheriff's Police, and that guy's name was Carl Humber. So you got Desplaines, and then you got Cook County, and the reason that, that was is because the, the particular town that Gacy lived in was had no police force of their own. It was unincorporated. So you had Cook County, which is the county that Chicago was in, 
and then you had Desplaines, which was the biggest department closest to Norwood Park. So they were going to handle the investigation. So they go in, they do the search, they scour the house, and this guy, Carl Humber, his one job, his only job, is to follow the cops around as they're searching the house and to photograph every single piece of evidence that they find and to note where it was found. That's how lawyers have a chain of custody created. And if you don't know what a chain of custody is, it's the absolute most important thing in order for the police to show how they were able to gather evidence, where they gathered it, and that so we know that they didn't plant it. It's, it's the only thing that allows for us to know exactly where it was found, when it was found, and then where it went after it left the house. If it's getting processed at the lab, that's no, it's noted on the, on the bags. So I sent you a picture of the receipt, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, yeah, I know. So as far as, um, as far as the receipt goes, the 13th comes and goes. Now, I have a photograph of it, if you guys, jump by the table or if you check out our website, which it's on there. The, the, the original photo receipt prepared by Carl Humber, who was the guy who was not working with the Splains, mysteriously shows that there's no photo receipt that was found in Gacy's garbage on December 13th. And that has been the story for the, the entirety of this case. That and the reason that it matters is because they didn't find anything on Gacy on the 13th that would allow them to arrest him. Do you understand? So, it's, it's, so Gacy is, he realizes that they're now going to watch him 24-7, which they do. So Cozen's ex says, okay, we, we searched the house. We didn't find anything that was linked to Rob Peace. They then go and talk to Kim Byers on the 12th as well. Kim Byers gives a very detailed statement to the police. She doesn't mention a photo receipt at any point. Three other cops that are following Gacy around 24-7 in 12-hour shifts. And what happens next, the, first, the second person, so when Darren and I find out that, that Albrecht has disclosed to us that they didn't find a photo receipt in the house, that means that they didn't have probable cause to get the second warrant, which is how they got Gacy under arrest. So the second warrant, which was issued on the 21st of December, was based on two things. It was based on the fact that there was a photo receipt that was found in Gacy's kitchen garbage that was in Rob Peast's pocket per information from Kim Byers. That did not happen. That was completely fabricated and injected into the case by Lieutenant Cozen's act. So the second cop we talked to, well, actually, the third cop we talked to. So Darren, Darren and I were blown away. Like, I've known everything about this case my entire life, and, and it's always been the photo receipt. The photo receipt, that's how they got him. That's how they got him. Like, it, without the photo receipt, there was no link. They followed this man around for 10 days, and they couldn't get anything on him. So you have a, a police lieutenant whose son attended the same school, and you've got a mother who is all over the displays police, and in particular, Lieutenant Cozen's are saying, find the guy, find the evidence to get the guy to kill my son. We all know, we get, it's, it's one of those incredibly frustrating situations for law enforcement when they know who the guy is, but they don't have the evidence to get him under arrest. And that's where we're at with Casey. So when Rob Robinson tells us this, they can, we don't even need that monster. What is these next? Okay. All right, so this is so this is the second guy we talked to, Dave Hackmeister, which he, he kind of confirms it, but you can tell he's backing away from the story because when we start, when Mike tells us that that they planted the evidence, and then we're wondering if the cops are calling each other, these old cops are saying, "Hey, you know, this this Mata guy just came and, and talked to me, and I, I told him about the the shit not being in the garbage in the house. I don't know if it's a big deal." So we didn't know. We didn't know if we were going to get there and Hackmeister was going to freeze us out because he was one of the other surveillance cops. He was totally right for us. He was totally right He's for totally us. Right like Mike, for us. Mike and Dave definitely talked. The third cop you're going to hear from, Ron Robinson, had not talked to either of those guys in 25 years. So this is what Dave had to say about the receipt. Man, not 100% sure, but I think Schultz got it out of the garbage. Thought that, that Schultz picked it up out of garbage in the front. Later heard, I think, from Hadol or somebody that it was 
that was found in the first search warrant, but I didn't know that for a fact. Yeah, that's because it wasn't a fact. It was not found in the first search warrant. So, but like the, these guys that were on the street in the Gacy case, and, and like when in, in our podcast, it's very thorough, but we go through almost all 10 days of the investigation, day by day, blow by blow. And the one thing that became obvious is that these cops that were out on the street between the detectives who were out trying to pound the pavement, knock on doors, talk to witnesses, and the cops who were following Gacy around 24-7 were not communicating. They had no idea, the left hand no, had no idea what the right hand was doing at all in this case. So. At some point, the third guy that we talked to, Ron Robinson, confirmed, because Darren and I are like, we have to vet this. Like, I'm not gonna put on my podcast that they've planted the evidence unless we can absolutely vet it. Now, I take the cops who, who did it is a, is a pretty good source, but the problem for us is that Cozen's act, the cop who actually injected and planted and manufactured the evidence is dead. So I call his wife, I'm like, look, you know, your husband's old cops are, are confessing that, that they planted the evidence on Gacy. And she's like, I mean, what was, what was she going to say? You know, so I'm trying to call Kim Byers, the girl who claimed that she put the, the evidence in Rob's pocket. I'm trying to call Terry Sullivan, who was the state's attorney, who was handling it for displaying at that they point. They aren't answering. They're not answering. <laughs> They're not answering. They, they, they will not come on the pod. And I, I've let them know what we've discovered. I'm not trying to ambush anybody. I'm saying, look, this is what the cops are telling us happened. So for further confirmation, we finally get a hold of this cop named Ron Robinson, and this is what Ron had to say. I told Bob that the garbage truck was coming down the street. I was going to let the garbage man put Casey's garbage on the truck, and then I was going to take it off. So I picked up the garbage. After I did that, I notified uh, Sergeant Lang. I said, uh, didn't want to put it over the air what we were doing. I said, uh, I'd like to meet up. I have uh, meet up with you. I have something for you. And just left it at that. Didn't say what, what it was. So that particular day, we wound up at, uh, I think it was a left side pharmacy at uh, Pulaski and North in Chicago. I met uh, Sergeant Lang there. And uh, Bob and I were together watching the pharmacy, and uh, but I went to the trunk, got the, the bag of garbage out, and gave it to uh, Sergeant Lang. Well, about it was several hours later, Sergeant Lang came and met us again, and Bob and I were once again sitting in the car, and uh, Sergeant Lang said that uh, they had found the receipt in the garbage for film that Rob Keith's girlfriend had deposited. So this she is She gone into the pharmacy, deposited the film, put the receipt in the pocket of Rob Keith's jacket. When she gave him back the jacket at the end of the night, she forgot the receipt. She had left it in there. So that receipt proved that Gacy had contact with Rob Keith because it had been in his jacket pocket. So, but he said that due to the circumstances, we were not to tell anybody about that. So for years, I never mentioned it to anybody. After Casey's execution, I figured, well, it doesn't really matter now. We can talk about it all we want. They can't resurrect him from the dead. All the appeals have been appealed and the sentence have been carried out. But for that period of time, I never talked about it, told anybody about it. Uh, yes, we, and I don't know what day the garbage was, but I know that they had executed a search warrant prior to that. Now, I was never told about that. I was never told that they were going to claim that that receipt had been found in the execution of that search warrant. But to the best of my knowledge, yeah, that's what, uh, what happened. So our minds were blown. And if you guys don't understand the difference between the receipt that's found, or, and so basically the way it goes down is we understand that 
that receipt wasn't found in the outside garbage either. Now that, that is the story that the cops were told by the, the, the lieutenant who had come up with this idea on how to create this link between Gacy and Peace. He had to tell his officer something. So as Ron said there, they were kind of under the impression that they had found it during the 13th, but no one had seen the report that was prepared by Humber, which I actually, we have the original copy of it. So when my father got the discovery file during the trial, they had plucked that particular property evidence sheet that had no evidence whatsoever that the photo receipt was found. And what they did is Cozen's act, the lieutenant, had prepared his own property inventory sheet, which is completely improper, and he injected the photo receipt into that particular piece of evidence that was submitted to the courts and said that it was found in the search on the 13th. So it was injected, it was in, it was at that point, and my father and Sam Amaranti had no way to know that Carl Humbert existed, because if they, if they had found out that Carl Humbert had been there, they of course would have spoken to him. Now the significance, so, so we have this moral dilemma, and, and we're like, okay, are people gonna be like, who gives a fuck? Gacy was horrible. Who cares if they planted evidence to get him? He was terrible. Remember one thing, when they planted the evidence, they were going after him for one kid. They had no idea he was a serial killer. They had no idea he had 29 bodies on his property, none. They were going after him because it was a cop obsessed with solving the case of one missing boy and that was Rob Peast. Now, ultimately when they end up digging up all the bodies, this cop who planted the evidence must have felt like a champion. He's like, oh my God, I just stopped like one of the most horrific serial killers in the history of the world. So our, our dilemma was, how do we make people understand that it matters? that the truth matters. Because people will ask me, they'll say, hey, you know what? Why does it matter? Like, why do you care? Why do you care? Well, number one, because it's the truth. And we all deserve to know the truth in terms of how cases are handled. And this is one of the biggest cases in American history. That's a fact. And the fact is that we've been lied to for 43 years. All of us agree it's the right result. <laughs> Gacy's exactly where Gacy belongs. However, to do it that way flies in the face of everything that our country stands for and the Constitution of the United States. If we allow them to start planting evidence on people that we think are really bad just because we can't get the evidence on the up and up, it's going to create a very slippery slope. We're going to have a lot of innocent people in prison. And the real cautionary tale about that is that had they found, had my father and Sam discovered that, my dad was a damn good lawyer. The only reason it wasn't discovered is because they plucked that document, which we were never supposed to get. We were, we were never supposed to get that document. It was never supposed to be seen by anybody else. So had they discovered that, there, there's this um, legal theory called fruit of the poisonous tree. And what that doctrine says is that if a piece of evidence is gotten by ill-gotten gains, meaning that they violated the Constitution or Fourth, Fifth, or Sixth Amendment rights, that a defense attorney has to go in in order to police the police to make sure that they're doing their job correctly. And they go in and they say, okay, they violated the Fourth Amendment, and they violated this guy's rights. And planting of evidence is beyond, that's just gross misconduct. It's beyond them not, not reading somebody their rights. It's beyond them fudging a little bit on a, on a search warrant complaint to get into a house. This is them injecting evidence into a case that doesn't exist in order to get him under arrest, which is ultimately what happened. So if they had discovered that, what would have happened is that every body that was found in that crawl space, every body that was found in that river would have all been suppressed. Okay, that means that Bill Kunkel, the, the the prosecuting attorney would have had to go to the families of 33 victims and tell them, my God, I'm sorry, but the case against them is going to have to get dropped because we have no evidence. All the evidence is suppressed because after Gacy's arrested on the 21st, he proceeds to give five confessions. Now, when he's talking about, like, our tapes that we have are basically my father going through the five confessions with Gacy saying, 
John, why are you saying that you, you, you went in and you made these five confessions and now you're telling me you can't remember anything? It was like three weeks ago. Can you explain to me how that is? And of course, Gacy always thought he was the smartest guy in the room. You know, so at that point, he's playing it that he's, a, that he's got the double, like a dual personality. So he's either Jack Hanley, which he started kind of throwing out there. He's like, well, I, I didn't say that, but Jack said it. And, and you know, so my father was not buying any of that shit. But they knew that they were going to have to go with the insanity defense because Gacy had made admissions. And once you make admissions, you can't come in and argue that the bodies were in there because Cram and Rossi had killed him and buried him in his cross because you can't say somebody else did it. He's made the admission. So at that point, the battle in, in a case like that with the insanity defense is that you have to try to, the state's burden is no longer to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he killed them. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he's insane. And the definition of insanity legally is vastly different than it is for the medical definition, legally insane means in Illinois at that time meant that he did not have the ability to control his behavior to comport with the requirements of the law. Meaning he knew it was wrong, but he had a compulsion to do what he was doing that he could not control. So that became what the battle was in that trial. It wasn't was Gacy and his sinner guilty of committing the crimes. And, and when we first uncovered the planet evidence. People are like, are you saying Casey didn't kill him? I'm like, no, man, Casey fucking killed him. <laughs> like, yes, he's a horrible human being. So, we, we, and I was gonna play for you, but we're running out of time. Like, so Carl Humbert, so like, we really felt like we needed to, to cement the fact that the way they got him, which is now an incredible story. I mean, it did, no matter which way you take it, the fact of the matter is, it's an amazing story on how they actually got him, and it's one that we didn't know. And it's just one of the most famous cases in the history of the country. So, do you want to play Humbert? Yep. So we're going to play Humbert. So he was the, the evidence tech who was in there. And this is what he told us. Just, no, no, no. no. Nothing like that. Um, no, uh, you know, I collected my stuff, and again, you know, if received it, you know, I can say this, I think, frankly, is that if, if that receipt, if the receipt was important because it was from the, the, the pharmacy where it, um, they had dropped off the film uh, to be developed, and so that was what that photo receipt was, would, have, would have been, and um, uh, so I, again, I, I, again, I know me too, I know I operated, I would have uh, the only reason we might have taken that um, because uh, of, of prints that submitted for prints, um, and if I see that, you know, if it was something we recovered, I'm sure that my photo sheet, I have some sort of operating my report on the table was recovered, or I may have photographed the material. Now I don't recall exactly, but um, you know, if that doesn't show up in my report, then I was unaware of it that night, and nobody spoke to me about anything like that. And so we, we collected the stuff we collected, and, and that was. You know, we documented it, as we always do, and that was the end of that story. Um, did you have a... So, that guy not being part of the Displays Police like, confirmed for us, like, that, that was the guy, and that was the guy who's evidence sheet. And so, you know, when I was interviewing him, I said, Carl, I have your, your actual inventory sheet in front of me, and it's not on there. He said, well, it wasn't there. So, that becomes like episodes nine through 10, and, and we were, it, it would, like for us, it was so stunning, and, and then you know we continue on through the podcast. And if you're you're interested in hearing Gacy talk and hearing him talk about, I think five of the killings, you know we have it in there. But but really, what the story was is about, and it's the most thorough thing that's ever been done on Gacy. I don't book documentary, like nothing compares to it. It's 36 episodes long. We were really able to get my father to perform his opening argument that he gave at trial, and we ended the series with the lead prosecutor, Bill Conkle, who got him convicted, uh, performing his entire closing argument, which is breathtaking. And only the people in that courtroom on that day are the only people on the planet that have ever heard it until now. And we think that it's the absolute authority on Gacy, and um, you know, 
anybody who's going to move forward teaching Gacy and college courses needs to realize that the narrative has changed. And at that point, I like to, does anybody have any questions? And it doesn't have to be about the photo receipt, it can be about anything, Gacy, because I know it all. <laughs> anybody? Anybody? I had the evidence been thrown out the other victims, what would have been the official, what would they have done with the victims? How would they have said what happened or not? Just unknown, we don't know. Everybody would know. No, I mean, every, everyone would know. I mean, the guy would walk, would walk. Like, based on police misconduct. That's what I'm saying. Like the, like, the case would have been in front of the judge. The judge would have had to rule on the motions. Now, my feeling is that Judge Garippo would have told. Yeah, my opinion is that he would have said, There's no way in hell I'm granting this motion to suppress because I'm not the asshole. The cops who planted the evidence and did this to the case are the assholes, and I'm going to send it up to the appellate court and make them do it. And then the appellate court's going to turn around, and they would have had no choice. There's a, like a lot of times in cases, if there's not police misconduct and there's like, you know, a, a concept called, you know, the eventual discovery, like eventually they would have discovered it, that the so appellate court, in a case like this of this magnitude, they would have figured out a way to weasel out of it and keep the evidence not suppressed, they, they wouldn't have had the opportunity because of the fact of the police misconduct. So ultimately what would have happened is that they would have had to suppress the evidence and there would have been zero evidence. Like you, like you like remember a trial is basically where you're going in, like the confessions are gone, the bodies are gone, all of the bodies, not just the ones in the river because the only way they knew that the bodies in the river were Gacy's is because he confessed that he dumped four in the river. Like, they, like back then, they didn't have DNA. It wasn't like it is now. So, you know, that that's, like, ultimately that's where we're at. You know, we're doing a part two of Gacy, and it's not going to be with the tapes, but we believe, I'm working with an old Chicago cop named Bill Dorsch, and Bill Dorsch has been working the Gacy case for 20 years because he was furious that Chicago police had absolutely shit the bed with that case. Had they done any modicum of police work, after the third kid, John Bukovic, had been killed, or John Zick, who we believe was somewhere in five to six, they had done anything. They had done any investigation. So they like, oh, you know what, they're gay kids. It's a gay fight, we don't care. Uh, they ran away, we don't care. You know, they're in California, we don't care. They, did, they didn't care. There were 40,000 missing kids in Chicago during that time frame. The Chicago police didn't do a fucking thing. And I roast them in my podcast. I hold them accountable for what they did because 20 plus kids lost their lives because they didn't want to do their job. So Bill Dorsch, who was a former Chicago homicide detective, we are going to find more victims. Now we know there's a property in Miami and Elston that they did a sham dig in 1998. And Bill Dorsch is actually the person who went with ground penetrating radar and found anomalies all over. And so they call in when they do the sham dig. This is the Cook County Sheriff Police. The, the guy who did the, the actual country and radar readings, he gave them the data. He said, okay, look, there's only one place that you don't need to look that we didn't find anything. That's where they put the tent up and dig. So that, that was a 15 minute dig. They had a tent up, no press was allowed in. They come out 15 minutes later and they said, nothing. Chicago doesn't want bodies. Remember, this is a Displains case. This was not a Chicago. Chicago does not want more Gacy bodies. You guys have all heard about Chicago in the news. It's like a murder city. Like every murder, that murder count that grows in any major city, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, so to, for Chicago, for liability's sake, now for us to discover bodies that shouldn't have happened if they would have done their jobs with Bukovic, because they had everything they needed. I looked through the, the, the police reports that Chicago had and the information they had. If they would have done the simple thing of going over to Gacy's house and questioning him, John Bukovic would go, like, we know, we all know that the last place he was was your house at 2 in the morning. Where is he? His car is here. His prized possession is here with his wallet and his jacket sitting on the block with the keys in it. Where is he, John? He had no answers. They would have stopped him and they did nothing about it. So what we're going to be going out in part two, and we're hoping it's actually going to be turned into a documentary. We think that we've got some interest in it. We're going to be going out, we're going to be doing the digs because we think that there's more Gacy victims. As a matter of fact, we're confident that there are because there was a gap from 72 to 76 where he was married to Carol Hoff who lived in that house where they think that Gacy was dormant. His 
first victim allegedly was 72. I don't believe that either. I think he was killing in Iowa. And I think he was killing before he went to prison in Waterloo. So um, look for that down the road. Um, if you guys were going to be at the table for a bit, we'd love for you guys to come pick up a little merch if you have any questions. And we'd love for you to listen to the show. We think it's going to be worth your time. Um, if you found this even mildly interesting, the podcast is way more expansive. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's densely packed, but, um, you know, we think it's one of the best podcasts out there. So I thank you for your time. Does anybody have any questions? If you have any questions, you can meet me over at the, the table. All right? Thank you.